and chair of torture while they flashed nasty bits of ultraviolence on the screen. Though not on the soundtrack, my brothers, the only sound being music. When Rudy Giuliani shared bad intel from Ukraine, or when TikTok influencers say COVID can cause pain, they're laundering disinfo when we really should take note and not support their lies with our wallet, voice, or vote. Oh! Kill me. What makes news real or fake? You are fake news. The obvious answer is, well, real news is based on real events and facts, well, fake news is based on misinformation and often political spin. However, things aren't always so quite clear-cut. In 2003, it was real news that there were WMDs in Iraq, only to later be proven to be fake news. In 2017, it was real news that the Russians hacked the election in favor of Trump, and that's now since been proven fake, at least in terms of the framing, as while Russians may have hacked the DNC, there's never been any evidence that voting machines were compromised. In 2019, it was fake news that Hunter Biden had been working for energy company Burisma, organizing deals and meetings to grow his family's influence in Ukraine and in DC, all while lining his own pockets. But we now know that that too was, in fact, real. Whether news is real or fake seems highly dependent on when that news is being discussed. But because news is subject to change, how does that misinformation, even after having been corrected, influence public opinion long term? Further, while some news reporting may be intentionally false or just sloppy, oftentimes available information changes over time as more is revealed, as is often the case during conflict. Considering that Joe Biden has created a new disinformation governance board, which totally isn't a more palatable way of saying Ministry of Truth, which he totally did just coincidentally on the same week that Elon Musk began to close in on purchasing Twitter. What a coincidence! And the head of that new board? Why, it's none other than Nina Yankovic, who helped disseminate the now fake news about Hunter Biden's laptop, in addition to posting some serious dystopian cringe. I wanna be rich, famous, and powerful. Step on all my enemies and never do a thing. I wanna be rich, famous, and powerful. So all I have to do in life is sit around and sing. Hey boss, I have a cancer. The importance of the effects of disinformation are of increasing concern for the future of free speech and freedoms in general. Today, let's look at the effects of corrections and updates on news stories and on public trust and opinion, as well as how the fog of war may obfuscate news and influence the way that people see a war, be it on information or on the ground. But first, because the news can often change, leading people to question what we can trust, let me tell you about a product with quality you absolutely can trust. And that's Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon offers a line of cereals that taste great and come in a variety of fun flavors reminiscent of childhood favorites, but all guilt-free, with each serving containing zero grams of sugar, with the exception of their new honey flavor made with real honey that only has one gram of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs, and about 140 calories. Whether you're looking to get in shape for summer, lose those COVID pounds, or just improve your diet, Magic Spoon is a great way to cut excess carbs from your diet while still getting the enjoyment of eating something that tastes sweet and satisfying. If you're like me and follow a low-carb diet or a keto regimen but love carbs, rest assured Magic Spoon won't disrupt your diet nor your day by spending time preparing special low-carb snacks, but still satiates the sweet tooth and the desire for carbs. It's also gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free, so plenty of people can get in on a healthy dose of nostalgic nutrition. I've liked all the ones that I've tried, but the fruity one is definitely my favorite, although the peanut butter is a close second. If you want to support the channel and support your own health with a nutritious breakfast, then consider clicking the link down below and using my code AIDEN, that's A-Y-D-I-N, to get $5 off your order and try Magic Spoon for yourself to find your own favorite flavor. So, now that we've got our bowl of breakfast that you can trust, let's talk about that thing that so many people don't trust anymore, and that's journalism and news media. We all rely on cognitive heuristics to greater or lesser degrees. Cognitive heuristics are mental shortcuts that allow us to navigate life more easily without the need to stop and deeply consider every single action or reaction. Some heuristics exist to protect us from danger. For example, we may recoil when we see a stick in the grass, anticipating it to be a snake, as a method of self-preservation, much as cats are afraid of cucumbers and horror games. Oh. 
However, other heuristics exist simply to reduce mental strain. Because our brains are so complex and utilize so much energy, heuristics evolved not just as a protective mechanism, but also as a method of avoiding engaging in too much complex processing. Again, mental shortcuts. One such heuristic that has been seemingly failing in its viability as a useful evolutionary stratagem in the past few years is our tendency to believe what we read. Gallup polling data are indicative that trust in the media is at an all-time low and on a downward trending path, with 36% of Americans reporting trust in mass media in 2021 compared to 53% in 1997. This tendency has been particularly pronounced amongst Republicans, as while Democrats' trust decreased by 20 points, more or less overnight after the 2016 election, later leveling out at about 68% in 2021 compared to 64% trust held by Democrats in 97, for Republicans and Independents, the results have been consistent, a continual spiral into distrust. While 41% of Republicans trusted mass media in 97, by 2021, this proportion had dipped to 11%. Independents saw less dramatic but still persistent declines, with 53% reporting trust in media in 97 versus only 31% in 2021. In addition to falling trust in media institutions, trust in journalists as professionals has also declined rapidly, as Pew polling illustrates that between December of 2018 and 2021, the percentage of people who reported very little or no trust in journalists increased from 44% to 60%, or as the ballistics community knows it, the difference between a sore wrist and a broken nose. While the portion of the populace that reported trusting journalists a great deal fell from 15% to a meager 6% over that exact same time span. <laughs> Clearly, fewer and fewer people are relying on heuristic trust in the media. And why shouldn't they, in a world that we are told is full of fake news? While Trump certainly didn't invent the term, he surely popularized its usage, and ever since he called CNN correspondent Jim Acosta fake news in 2017, both sides of the political aisle have been wont to accuse the other of the practice, or perhaps more accurately, malpractice of journalism. And why shouldn't both sides accuse the others of being fake news when, well, particularly over the last few years, the media landscape has been littered with misinformation, hoaxes, and cover-ups? From minor instances such as a 2015 report that Pope Francis had officially endorsed Trump's run for office to issues of serious national or even international concern, such as the time that Pakistan's foreign affairs minister sent out a threatening tweet suggesting the use of nuclear weapons against Israel, having read himself a fake news story which claimed that the Israeli defense minister had first engaged in nuclear saber-rattling against Pakistan. Fake news continues to influence people from all over the world and the political spectrum. And trust me, it is a spectrum. Please clap. It is, however, at least interesting to me that some seem more willing than others to admit their mistakes in reporting than others. Looking at you, Brian Stelter. Uh, all the mistakes of the mainstream media and CNN in particular seem to magically all go in one direction. Are we expected to believe that this is all just some sort of random coincidence or is there something else behind it? It's too bad, it's time for lunch. Union break! How's that disingenuity working out for CNN Plus, by the way? Rare to see a service last about as long as the average Warhammer MMO. But while much of the right-leaning media has focused on debunking claims made by left-leaning sources, the left-leaning media, particularly regarding stories related to the 2020 election and COVID-19, have persistently emphasized the deep socio-political harm that can be caused by sharing fake news. And this, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. So how prevalent is fake news? Well, an analysis of Twitter posts from Grinberg et al. 2019, conducted during 2016, found that only 1% of users were exposed to the majority, 80% of sources deemed to be fake news by these scholars, and that 0.1% of accounts were responsible for posting those fake news pieces. As such, it seems that the vast majority of people were very unlikely to have been exposed to overtly fake news stories. However, there is an issue with Grinberg et al.'s methodology in that it often takes time for stories to be confirmed as fake news. For example, it took years for the mainstream media to admit that information obtained from Hunter Biden's laptop was in fact legitimate. Although certainly that particular story would never have entered into Grinberg et al's dataset, given that Twitter outright banned sharing of the story and the New York Post, silencing what we now know as a legitimate news story out of claims of it being what else but fake news. Similarly, for a period of time, it was a fake news story that Nicholas Sandman didn't harass a Native American man, fake news that Jussie Smollett was not accosted and attacked by racists shouting, this is MAGA country at 2 a.m. in downtown Chicago, 
evidence, racist attacks are a lot like shark attacks. You're far more likely to be victimized by Ezra Miller than either of them. Fake news to even acknowledge the existence of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, let alone US funding going towards it and the gain-of-function research being conducted there. But we now all know that these stories were in fact very much true. There is perhaps no better way to illustrate the temporary nature of fake news than to examine a study from Vosogi, Roy, and Aral, 2018, who studied the spread of fake news stories across Twitter between 2006 and 2017 and reported that falsehood diffused significantly further, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in all categories of information, and the effects were more pronounced for false political news than for false news about terrorism, natural disasters, science, urban legends, or financial information. These results were themselves spread far and wide, not only having been cited more than 4,000 times in other academic publications, but also having been reported on by the BBC, PBS, The Guardian, and countless other news outlets as evidence that the internet was a terrifying place full of falsities around every corner. And there is some real irony there in that this exact study was largely refuted in a replication from Joel and Ugander 2021, who conducted a reanalysis of Vosogli et al.'s work and found that when removing bias towards stories that had been confirmed as fake by a fact checker, that the actual spread of fake news and real news was nearly identical in speed and in depth. Although Joel and Ulgander did confirm that fake news tended to spread further, the media had largely distorted the findings of Vosogli et al catastrophizing them into evidence of Russian interference, the topic du jour in 2018. But unlike Vesogli et al.'s initial study, which Jules and Ugander's reanalysis and contextualization was covered only by a handful of outlets and sits at a mere six citations, perhaps serendipitously providing evidence to Vesogli's own hypothesis that fake news, or in this case data reported on largely falsely, penetrates further, faster, and more broadly than the truth a bizarre case of quad non erit demonstrandum. As such, whether or not a story is fake news is also temporally based, as what is true today may be fake tomorrow and vice versa, and unfortunately the metaphysical nature of these Schrodinger's stories can have very real-world consequences. From Smollett's claims fueling a summer of live mean spicy block parties, to the ongoing arrest and detention of many people who participated in Jan 6, as even after a year, many are still without trial, and those trials are now returning not guilty verdicts, as evidence of participants being ushered into the building are being shown to the court. Fake news, truly fake news, made either by obfuscating the truth, or outright lying, or just having shoddy facts to go off of, can all have very serious influences on the world. So how do people manage and navigate that world? littered as much as it is, admittedly, to a lesser degree than many media outlets desperate to fear monger would claim, because of course the media outlets that insist their own fake news is non-extant, but I digress. Point is, how do people determine if news is fake or real, particularly on social media where news moves at a mile a minute? Well, Metzger and Flanagan 2013 proposed that heuristic processing allows people to quickly assess the credibility of a source through a variety of these mental shortcuts. The reputation heuristic is such that people will tend to see sources with a reputation of good reporting in the past as more credible sources across the board. But this can also apply merely to name recognition, in that people may be more likely to trust information from a source whose name merely sounds familiar than from a non-familiar source. This heuristic bears close resemblance to the appeal to authority fallacy. It's quite similar to brand recognition, but as we all know, just because a brand is well-known does not necessarily mean that it's good. Hell, Supreme, which started out as a parody, becoming a brand that people are willing to commit crimes over, is evidence of that. I think the brand is so f***ing powerful that it's making me buy a f***ing crowbar. Similarly, the endorsement heuristic prefers information that is recommended by a known source over an unknown source. And as such, we may be more likely to believe the credibility of an article when it is shared by our friends or others that we trust better the devil you know. But we may also be influenced if a large number of people are also sharing that source, indicating to observers via the ad populum fallacy that there is some consensus of belief. Relatedly, the people may utilize the consistency heuristic to see if various sources are reporting on a subject matter in the same or similar ways, as evidence of consensus. While the beliefs of those we trust, be they news outlets or friends, provide their own heuristic properties, we may also utilize the self-consistency heuristic to avoid cognitive dissonance. That is a feeling of psychological discomfort experienced when our previously held beliefs are at odds with new information. As such, when faced with contradictory data, we have three general routes of processing. 
either ignore the new information, reject the new information, or accept that new information. And that last one, given that it highlights our own past mistakes, is the rarest route taken. Instead, when exposed to a source that conflicts with what we already believe, heuristic processing will tend to reject that source as just not credible. In this way, corrections to misinformation may seem more incorrect than the actual misinformation. Much in the same way, when something about a credible source conflicts with what we expect, that also produces an expectancy violation heuristic and may cause dismissal of the source. For example, if a news website contains typos or looks to be of amateurish quality, that will tend to violate our expectation of a credible source, resulting in dismissal, whereas sites that seem very professional may gain a halo effect that frames anything they publish as seemingly more credible. To see this in action, the question of how people go about deciding if a source was fake news was posed to a sample of Singaporean participants by Tandak et al. 2020, and they found that people who had any doubts about the claims of a media message responded to those doubts either incidentally, by just coming across additional information over time, or assessing if the story was being shared by friends to get a sense of its popularity, or intentionally, by looking up more information online and across different outlets, or by asking others, be they family, friends, or experts. Several subjects noted relying on instinct and experiences to determine if a story sounded fishy, while others relied on the reputation of the news publication as confirmation of the veracity of a story, while still others relied on the contents of the message itself as often being indicative that something about the article was false. As such, it seems that when people have a good sense that something might be unusual about a story, they may wait for new information to be revealed or may intentionally seek out confirmation of what they already believe. However, Oftentimes, that involves reliance on the reputation of an outlet. And if that outlet is CNN, well, it may not mean much. It's too bad, it's time for lunch. Point is, though, that we often decide very quickly, heuristically, whether or not we believe a news source based on intuition, not on systemic processing. While Tanduk et al.'s study can give us a basic idea, we can understand more about heuristic processing and how it's used in an assessment of the veracity of news on social media by looking to a study from Ali, Lee, and Zafar 2021. And I thought about making an Aladdin reference here, but Disney's having a rough of enough time as it is. I don't want to give them an excuse to make money off of this video. Make way, here it comes, bring cash, all you bums. Oh, you got a way to buy DLC, it's gonna be pretty expensive. Yeah, you bet. Show some respect. No, it's not free. Anyway, Ali et al. exposed subjects to a simulated Facebook post linking to a news article as well as to the article itself which was either real, concerning the viral Tide Pod challenge, or fake, reporting that Tide would be discontinuing their prod product in response to the challenge. Further, the post either had received many likes or only a few, manipulating perceptions of social endorsement. Perceptions of social endorsement, perceptions of news source credibility, the degree of cognitive elaboration, that's how much time one thought about the subject, intentions to share the article, emotions experienced in reaction to the article, daily social media use in general, social media use concerning news specifically, frequency of sharing on social media, and the type of audience most users believed typically saw their posts, ranging from strangers to close friends, were all measured. There was a moderate correlation between perceptions of message credibility and elaboration, that is, thinking more about the topic again, a smaller correlation between elaboration and sharing intent, and the weakest correlation between perceived credibility and sharing intent. News veracity was negatively related to perceived credibility, that is, fake news was not seen as credible. However, social endorsements moderated this relationship, meaning that fake news posts on Facebook were seen as more credible when they had more likes. Perceived credibility of news was positively related to cognitive elaboration, which in turn was related positively to intentions to share the story. However, while credibility was related to thinking more about the subject matter, veracity was not, meaning ultimately, it may be the name of an outlet that matters more than the actual truth when it comes to eyes on a page and sharing of that news outlet. The effects of likes on increased perceptions of credibility on fake news was negligible, however, never approaching the perceptions given to legitimate news, which was generally unaffected by the number of likes on the Facebook post. These results are indicative, then, that people can generally tell fake news from real news, but they do seem to rely on their heuristic processing to do so. And that often means trusting some news outlets to be more credible than others. Outside of the realm of delicious Tide Pods, and instead specifically concerning politics, Stefanone, Volmer, and Covert 2019 examined heuristics, credibility, and the sharing of fake news online. College students were surveyed on their social media use and their political leanings, and then exposed to six news articles, and not the kind of news exposure that's typically preferred by Jeffrey Tubin, 
covering the 2018 migrant caravan approaching the United States. These articles were curated from allsides.com to determine political valence and were either center-leaning, left-leaning, or right-leaning, and contained either entirely factual information or entirely false information. Civics were asked if they would share the article, either online or across various apps or offline, and their reasons for doing so or choosing not to do so. Perceptions of news source credibility were also measured, along with personal interest in politics and religious beliefs. They found that perceived credibility of the news source was related to sharing across all conditions, that is, regardless of political valence, with credibility explaining 5.7% of the variance in choice to share a news source. Of their sample, 68% said they would share the news article online, and 63.6% .6 would share it offline. For the minority who said that they would not share the article, 82.5% did not agree with the news article, 75.4% indicated that the news was not significant enough to share, 71.9% thought that the news in general was already shared enough by others, and 50.9% indicated that they tended just not to share things with others. Of course, subjects could choose more than one option here, hence why it adds up to more than 100. Those who expressed a higher degree of interest in politics were not more nor less likely to correctly predict which articles were credible and which were fake. However, those more concerned with the political world were more likely to report being willing to share fact-based articles from a balanced or left-leaning bias than from a right-leaning one. This result may be attributable to the fact that 77% of the sample were self-identified Democrats, though, indicating that people, rather unsurprisingly, are motivated to believe information that aligns with their political views as more credible and subsequently be want to share that information. The results of this study are indicative that people will share information that they think is credible, even if it's not, and may be more likely to find a source credible when it also aligns with their existing political beliefs. A longitudinal result of this kind of sharing may lead to the creation of filter bubbles, a theory of social networks which proposes that, due to the nature of social media algorithms, people find themselves in insular bubbles where they are only recommended information that already conforms to their pre-existing beliefs or interests. Dr. Noel Neumann hypothesized that when people end up in one of these filter bubbles or echo chambers, they also become disincentivized from questioning the predominant narrative, seeing themselves as an outlier and wishing to avoid confrontation with others, causing them to refrain from contradicting the information that they are seeing in what she calls the spiral of silence. To understand these processes better in our relationship to political news, we can look to a study from Rhodes 2021, who exposed subjects to a feed of news content that was either homogenous, favoring either a Democrat or Republican perspective, and mimicking a filter bubble, or heterogeneous, featuring articles from both perspectives. These feeds either contained factual articles or fake news. For example, a fake Republican-leaning article stated that pedophilia was being debated as a sexual orientation and potentially included in a new pride flag. Well, at least that was fake as of the time of data collection. But who knows what the future holds? Now activity will into focus. Like I said, kids are cruel, Jack, and I love my lips. Before exposure to these feeds, half of participants were shown a video about fake news, including tips on how to spot it. Respondents were also asked about their social media use, political orientation, and general political knowledge. After reading through the feed, subjects were also asked if they believed they had been exposed to a naturally occurring feed or a filter bubble. Finally, respondents were asked about their tendency towards heuristic processing, focusing on a few key points or systematic processing, that is, reading things carefully even if it disagreed with their political perspective. Rhodes found that Republicans were always more likely to rate fake news as accurate compared to Democrats. However, the presence of the filter bubble played a significant role here. Self-described Republicans were more likely to see fake news as accurate when in a heterogeneous news environment than in a homogeneous one that included news aligned both with and against their political perspective. In contrast, Democrats rarely viewed fake news as accurate when it was paired with articles that both aligned and misaligned with their own politics. However, when exposed to a feed of politically homogenous articles, Democrats were only slightly more able to determine fake news as, well, fake than were Republicans. As such, while it may be that Republicans are a bit more likely to buy into fake news, Democrats are about as likely to do so when they're forced into a political filter bubble. When social media websites such as Twitter and Facebook ban entire stories because they paint a certain politician or politician's son in a negative light, perhaps best exemplified in the removal of the now confirmed as not fake Hunter Biden laptop story, or when they remove politicians of a certain party altogether as they have with Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene, or any member of the strange but highly entertaining racist Star Trek side of Twitter. They occupy just 10% of Nigerian space but take up nearly 80% of the space 
in Nigerian prisons. Maybe they commit more crimes. Damn! Well, then Democrats are about as susceptible as Republicans to fall for fake news. A second study examining heuristic processing further found that those exposed to a filter bubble with only partisan information tended to engage in more heuristic processing, while there was no relationship to systematic processing. While at first glance, this too seemed to more strongly influence Republicans, further analysis found that this was not significant. Thus, while Republicans may be a bit more susceptible to fake news, it is highly dependent on the presence of a partisan filter bubble, as when Democrats are not faced with information that conflicts with their worldview, they are about as susceptible as Republicans. And moreover, partisan filter bubbles seem to prompt heuristic processing rather than systematic processing in individuals regardless of political party. In other words, when you're in a filter bubble, you don't even have to think about it. With scientists and shit, they just tell us what to do. You don't have to think about it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so just how good are we at detecting fake news in general? And is it possible that the cultural focus on the topic of fake news being of increasing and perpetual importance, both for the right and for the left, continually accusing each other of the practice, has created an environment where real news is perceived of as fake. How exactly goes the progress of former CIA director William Casey, who once said, quote, We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Lou Hancock and Markowitz 2020 conducted a preliminary analysis to see how able people were to discern fake news versus real news across a variety of subjects, specifically politics, health, and science, by exposing them to 10 headlines, half fake, half real, related to these three topics, and presented them in the form of a Facebook post. Political news items included headlines about government and political figures such as, quote, Trump's personal lawyer costs taxpayers $10,000 an hour, health news stories including content regarding food, medical treatment, and health behaviors, for example, quote, daily dose of diet soda tied to triple risk of deadly stroke, and finally, science news stories involved scientific discoveries and research findings such as, get ready, the brightest meteor shower in recorded human history is happening, not to be confused with large men riding comically small horses. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Subjects were then asked to rate on a Likert-type instrument how real they believed the headline was, between 1, definitely fake, and 7, definitely real. Contrary to the scholar's hypothesis, participants were generally more skeptical of news than they were prone towards belief in the veracity of headlines, judging only 44.6% of the headlines as real in total, when half of them were real. In turn, these subjects were also better at detecting actual deception than pure random chance, although, again, not by much, with 53.5% accuracy in discerning fake news. While these are not massive disparities, the data are indicative that people are actually more sensitive to fake news to the point of over-detection of real news while being slightly better than random chance at identifying actual fake news headlines, although both findings are minor and only slightly better than a coin flip, which doesn't exactly inspire confidence. A second study in this set sought to further elaborate on the influence of likes and thereby perceived consensus on these perceptions of the realness or fakeness of news shared online as, after all, a key feature of social media sites is the inclusion of some sort of function to illustrate support. Well, at least on social media sites outside of YouTube, which had to remove them because cringe kept getting ratioed. <laughs> oh, that's hot. Subjects were exposed to the same stimuli as before, but this time the posts included either a large or small number of likes from Facebook friends or from strangers on the platform. To add to the external validity, participants signed into their own Facebook profile before being shown these curated versions of their feed that explicitly noted how many friends had liked the post or how many people in general had liked it. They found that news posts with fewer likes were seen as less credible across all subjects. However, this was particularly pronounced in the topic of health-related headlines. Whether the likes came from friends or from strangers had no influence on this trend. Political headlines produced the most accuracy in detection of deception, both for real and fake news, being largely unaffected by the number of likes that post contained. As before, subjects were more able to detect fake news was fake than they were to detect that real news was real. Accuracy was generally lowest concerning science headlines in general. The most pronounced result, however, concerned health posts with low numbers of likes, as participants were very low in accuracy in determining if a health headline with a few likes was real. 
However, they were far more accurate in detecting if a health headline with a few likes was fake. These results then are indicative that people are actually least likely to fall for political fake news, but there is a tendency across all topics for fake news to be more easily detectable than is real news. The two exceptions to that tendency was science and health headlines that received a large number of likes. The relevant takeaway here then is that while on the positive side, people are quite sensitive to fake political news, they're also less able to determine if political news is real than if it's fake. These results may be attributable to the overuse of the very term fake news, resulting in a diminished capacity to identify real news as in fact real, perhaps because, as previously mentioned, both sides have a tendency to accuse the other of wrongdoing and lying in the form of fake news, a concept which was assessed by Tong et al. 2020, who were interested not only in how Americans defined fake news, but how they perceived of it. College students were asked about their political party identification, the strength of their partisan leanings, the extent of their use of both traditional and social media, how polarized they believed the US political landscape was, and their general political interests. For those who gave a non-political definition of fake news, about 66% offered more complex descriptions such as, fake news is news that is fabricated for the sake of destroying the reputation of a group or person, while others described it simply as lies or disinformation. The term disinformation in particular was used in nearly 40% of responses. In contrast, only 15% of subjects who were not directly political in their definition used words related to bias or spin as an element of what defines fake news. Further, 33% of politically neutral responses referred to fake news as a type of misreporting. For the other 34% of participants who gave a politicized definition of fake news, 40% of them used the word Trump, and of those that did, 73% accused him of being responsible for its propagation. A bit ironic that Trump popularized the term, but then became seen as the great perpetrator of it, all while it seems there's no consensus as to what fake news even is. Anyway, 70% of all politicized responses mentioned at least one specific media outlet in their description of fake news, with 37% criticizing what they described as mainstream news, such as CNN, 27% blaming conservative media, specifically Fox, and 34% blaming left-leaning media, specifying MSNBC. Of the subjects who gave a politicized answer to the question of what is fake news, more than half, 53% self-identified as conservative, while 23% identified as liberal, with the remaining 24% identifying as independents. Only 10% of politicized responses identified exclusively online outlets such as Facebook itself or BuzzFeed in their definitions of fake news. Further inferential analysis revealed that high political interest, strength of partisanship, and high perceptions of personal fake news exposure were associated with a higher likelihood of providing a politicized definition of fake news over a more neutral one. Specifically, for each one-point increase in political partisanship and interest, the odds of describing fake news in a politicized manner increased by 1.35 times. In general, Trump and right-wing media was blamed more commonly for the dissemination of fake news, mentioned in a total of 57.3% of politicized definitions, comparatively to 40.2% of responses that blamed left-wing media. Only 2.6% of respondents indicated that both sides were responsible for fake news. Sad. Identification with a political party was also influential in this trend, as a one-point increase in identification with the Democratic Party nearly tripled the odds of blaming Trump and right-leaning media for the dissemination of fake news. Further, subjects who provided a politicized definition of fake news described the two main U.S. political parties as significantly more polarized than those who gave a general definition by 8.49 points. Thus, it seems that people are actually pretty decent at discerning fake news, so good in fact that they are better at determining if a headline is fake than if it is real, as it relates specifically to political topics, although partisanship can also produce a propensity to blame the other side for the existence of said fake news. As Tong et al.'s data were indicative, only a third of people defined fake news through a political lens, and that tendency was related to political interest and to partisanship. So what about the other two-thirds of people? How do they see and assess the news that they may see as either fake or real? 43 in-depth interviews of British adults conducted by Toff and Nielsen 2018 may help provide some insight into the ways that people see and interact with news through a number of folk narratives. The first narrative is that news simply finds the individual, rather than the other way around. People who described news in this way tended to think that others in their social network, either online or off, would provide them with all of the information that they would need to sufficiently understand a trending topic. As Cameron explained, news should come looking for me, I shouldn't go looking for it. Wasn't that Live Leaks motto for a while? 
And as further elaborated upon by Emily, quote, if I need to know something, then somebody would probably knock on my door and tell me. Not sure if Emily is at all familiar with the Jehovah's Witnesses. This will tell you most of what you need to know about the DMV, but just go. Everyone there is really nice. Your government is watching you and your government wants you to be happy. Have a nice day. Although these people tended to avoid news, they also expressed that they felt informed enough, particularly as it concerns big issues, as many noted being interested in stories that everyone was talking about, including the election of Trump and Brexit. The second folk narrative identified by Toff and Nielsen in these interviews was a perception that the information was out there if needed. Much like the first theory, this one also relies on an assumption that information on any news topic is readily available and highly reliable. Many of the interviewees who fell into this category emphasized that if they needed to know something, rather than waiting for someone to tell them about it, like Emily, they could simply Google it. Jody described this position fairly succinctly, saying, quote, I think I could probably access it if I wanted to. I think it's there. The fact that I chose not to access a lot of it is down to me. Really, I think more than anyone else. Not all of those who had faith in the idea that correct information was out there, somewhere in the digital ether, were also convinced that all information was equally credible. And several mentioned the importance of looking at several sources or simply relying on Google to provide them with only the most accurate information. Specifically, when asked by the interviewer why she used Google for her primary news source, Holly explained. Brexit, and see what comes up. The latest on Brexit, that's what I would Google, or like, what will the British pound be worth? What changes are going to happen to the economy? That's what I'd Google, probably. Are there specific sources that you would be more trusting of that came up on Google? Articles from independent researchers, not like news. Why not news? Because I just feel like you just don't know. Look, how people are saying it's fake. It's just fake, isn't it? Holly's belief that mainstream news was fake and less reliable than Google not only reflects much of what we've already looked at. What was that? Do you just say you get your news from CNN? Pfft, bruh. I get my news from Reddit. You should educate yourself a little bit. Putin 2020, suka bliet. My name's Jeff, nugget biscuit, nugget in a biscuit. But also leads us into a third folk theory identified in these interviews, which is a feeling that one simply does not know what to believe. Unlike interviewees who utilized the two previous theories, these subjects believed that the information may be out there, but that it was either too complex or too muddled to be accessible. A black hole of information, as Jane described it. While some, like Gracie, explained that it would be too difficult for her to understand the news in detail, saying, quote, it would probably end up being very heavily statistics and numbers and things, and that she couldn't be bothered to sort through all that information, others expressed concerns that the internet was so full of misinformation that it would be impossible to find the truth with Isabella elaborating, how do I know they're not lying to me? Or how do I know which one's telling the truth? So actually, I don't think, I don't know. You hear certain things or you see certain things. Obviously it depends. I find out a lot on Facebook, but I think it's probably a load of rubbish because it depends on their opinions. So it depends. I've got a certain someone on my Facebook and they're a totally think government lies to us and they've got all these conspiracy theories and I think I'll read it and think, oh, well, yeah, that's quite reasonable why he's like that. But then I'll read somebody else's and they have an opinion on immigrants and then I just don't know who to really believe. While many participants expressed some degree of anxiety in their ability to find the actual truth, not all of them did. And some were completely confident in their ability to gain accurate information if they needed to or if it was shared by a friend. For the average person who is not a heavily politicized news consumer, most of them seemed to either be passive, waiting for the news to come to them, or waiting until they had some reason to investigate or are overwhelmed by the prospect of needing to sift through a miasma of both fake and real news. Many seem more trusting of sites like Google over other news outlets, while others too are more skeptical of both, and still others simply expect their friends to curate the truth for them. As illustrated in several of Toff and Nielsen's interviews, a good number of people believe that the news media cannot be trusted to tell the truth, and it is riddled with bias. And really, are they wrong? To further break down how people perceive media bias and how that influences interpretation of the news, we can look back to another series of in-depth interviews of 26 American adults conducted by Tully, Vrega, and Smithson 2020. Subjects were asked to read and analyze two articles, one from Fox News and the other from the New York Times, both discussing ongoing droughts in California from different perspectives. The Fox piece, reprinted from the Associated Press, focused on individual issues faced by locals and residents in the area where the drought was occurring, while the New York Times piece focused on larger social issues and environmentalism. 
After reading and taking notes on the two articles, the researchers interviewed participants to get a sense of their reactions to them. All 26 subjects believed that their worldview influenced their own interpretation of the news. Interviewee 9, a self-described Republican, said that he intentionally seeks out sources that conform to his own viewpoint, while Interviewee 19, a Democrat, said she only reads things that she wants to hear about. And Interviewee 5, another Democrat, said that if an article she was reading did not align with her opinions, she simply would stop reading it. 32% of interviewees expressed concerns with the use of framing or biased word choice in the stories, and 23% made statements that alluded to a desire to try and read through the lines to see both sides of a story. Most of the interviewees said that when an article did not align with their beliefs, they did tend to stop reading it, ignored the information, and tended to feel angry rather than seeking out additional information, as was the case for Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. Several subjects, again, of all political backgrounds, noted that the outlet and writer itself were of equal or greater importance than the subject matter as a sign of credibility, relying on heuristic processing. Independents and Democrats specified that if the source was Fox, they would usually discount the information outright while several Republican subjects expressed the same sentiments towards MSNBC and Think Progress. For example, a Democrat interviewee stated that, quote, "...networks like Fox are extremely biased to the Republican agenda, and you can tell by the experts they bring in." While a Republican similarly expressed that he will only read left-leaning news sources to try and understand what the left is talking about, but that he didn't, quote, "...trust those sources as publications for unbiased reporting." Additionally, five participants mentioned that the funding behind a news source may be important or more important than the source's overt political bias alone. In terms of the story itself, the researchers found three general types of bias were mentioned by respondents when discussing it, first being the conservative-slash-liberal bias, which was the most commonly mentioned, and usually specifically noted the publication, either Fox or the New York Times, the second being bias related to climate change, and the third being bias in the intention of the article be it to appeal to emotions or appeal to authority. Despite recognizing these biases, few participants noted their own susceptibility to them. Although, as we know, you're not immune to propaganda. At the end of the day, you're going to want something, and someone is always trying to sell it to you. You are not immune to propaganda, and you never will be. Instead, focusing on how others might be influenced rather than themselves. One Democrat interviewee called the Fox News coverage ridiculous and went on to say that it was, quote, "...blatantly trying to play up the vet and family man thing from the farm and make it seem down to earth, just basically what you would expect from Fox News, I guess." While similarly, on the other side of the fence, a Republican said of the New York Times piece, quote, "...once I read the New York Times, and then the first words said, global warming caused by human emissions, so I pretty much knew. I knew pretty quickly where this was headed based on those two things." based on what publication it was, and, you know, the first five or six words in the piece, illustrating that both sides rely on heuristic processing to make decisions about a piece of news and dismiss its contents offhand. Only two of the 22 subjects noticed that the Fox News story was actually reprinted from the AP, and while one, a Republican, said that this was likely a story run by many outlets, the other participant who noticed the AP byline, who described himself as very liberal, intimated that the piece was a sob story intended to play on the emotions of Fox readers while praising the New York Times piece, saying it was, quote, "...very heavily science-based. I think they said global warming 20 times in there, and it wasn't about the people at all." You have a medical disorder. Although several critiqued Fox's focus on the human element, even some Democrat respondents noted that it might have been more effective, stating Fox, quote, "...probably did use better sources because they've thrown in the human element of how this issue, water, affects everyday people." Finally, a few subjects made note of how both perspectives are perhaps valuable, even though they were quite different, with a Republican woman from Washington, D.C. saying, quote, "...if I had read either of these separately, I would not have thought really much. I wouldn't have thought, oh, this one's biased or this one's biased. I would have accepted it as Fox News. Oh, it's a sad story. Or this New York Times. Oh, this is a really serious problem." Illustrating the value in different types of reporting. Thus, while partisanship produces heuristic processing and analysis of media content, often causing dismissal of an article just because of its source, some people are still able to see the value in multiple points of view, although that's seemingly the outlier and not the rule. It's not unlikely that one of the reasons for the increasing distrust in the media and reliance on heuristic processing is the increase in partisanship over time in the United States, leading to increased political incivility. Well, I think that just taking a look at, I don't know, any random interaction between the left and the right in the U.S. over the last few years could probably be indicative of the increased division and incivility that I'm referring to. We like stats here, so let's look at some. 
For example, the American Perspective survey from May of 2021 found that 29% of Democrats don't have a single Republican friend, compared to only 11% of Republicans who don't have a single Democrat friend. Similarly, more than half of Republicans had a few Democrat friends, while less than a third of Democrats had some Republican friends. 20% of Democrats said that they had ended friendships over politics, twice as many as Republicans. These results were more pronounced when looking at ideology, as 28% of self-described liberals ended friendships due to political differences, again compared to 10% of conservatives. Liberal women were, surprisingly, the most politically petty, with a third stating that they had ended a friendly relationship because of politics. Specifically, 22% of Americans ended a friendship over disagreements regarding Trump. Further, Axios polling from November of 2021 found that while only 5% of Republicans said they wouldn't be friends with someone who voted for Joe Biden, 37% of Democrats said they would not be friends with someone who voted for Trump. I don't want to make a tolerant left meme because it's so overplayed, but I mean, there's a reason it's so overplayed. To better understand how incivility in media messages influences political participation and trust, we can look to a meta-analysis from Von Triette and Stecklenburg 2022, including 35 experiments and 24 studies. The topics included culture war issues, including gay rights and abortion, as well as more detailed policy proposals, such as the labeling of GM crops. The results were such that political incivility from media sources produced a significant negative effect on trust in those media sources. Similarly, incivility had a negative effect on political participation. As such, when media outlets engage in disparagement of any group or ideology, it seems that such disparagement tends to produce both decreased trust in the media and the political process at large as well, and may disincentivize people from participating in the system altogether, perhaps fearing backlash for their participation. This can apply both to traditional participation in the form of voting and to speaking out publicly about one's beliefs. As such, when one side is portrayed as evil or irredeemable, that may create a silencing effect, a spiral of silence even, in terms of political participation, while simultaneously diminishing faith in the political system and particularly the media. We can apply the many folk theories that we looked at earlier related to fake news to the Ukraine-Russian conflict specifically by looking to a study from Pasitselka 2022, who interviewed Ukrainians in 2019 across three group sessions using narratives from two channels, TSN Tazden, or TSN Week, owned by Ukrainian oligarch Igor Kolomensky, which was favorable towards the Euromaidan movement and opposed the separatist movements in Crimea and Donbass, as well as Voskronovje Vremya, or Sunday Time, a weekly news program owned by Russian media outlet Ervi Kanal, or First Channel, which comparatively was supportive of the separatists and the Russian government. After the group sessions, Pasitselka also conducted 15 interviews in private over the course of 14 meetings to get a better idea of how people felt about the ongoing conflict between the two countries. And remember, this is back in 2019. And these interviews and sessions were assessed under the framework of pragmatic trust, which is again the concept that people are unable to be equally critical of all media all of the time. After each media session, participants' trust in media was assessed. The interviews revealed that most subjects did not tend to differentiate journalists from those who own or ran the outlets that they work for, with Maria expressing that, quote, Here in Ukraine, the television is all private. It belongs to certain persons, and there is not always shown, like, The truth. The truth. The truth. Let's say our oligarchs from the eastern Ukraine, well, they have their interests. Let's say they support terrorists. Some, such as Anatoly, suggested that everyone just needed to think for themselves to understand what's going on, which the rest of the group agreed with, while others, such as Alexandra, lamented that while there may be a few truthful channels, there were more that tended to lie. And when Natalia suggested that people need to rely on word of mouth, Alexandra further decried the current media state as primitive. In another session, other Ukrainian interviewees expressed a belief that media disinformation could actually be useful. Our media, they can even in moments say something untruthful, but this would be some contra... Course. Yes, contra course against the aggressor. Let's put it that way. With untruth. Well, maybe. Wait, but how, how much redundant information, plainly bullshit information is pouring at us? And that's why our media raises too much distrust, because they can even say untruth. Well, like, what do you want? We've got a war here. As such, as national sovereignty or safety was concerned, it seemed that these participants believed that disinformation could actually be a useful tool, surely a sentiment shared by anyone being aggressed upon in a conflict. Similarly, other respondents were annoyed with the media not framing their political personal views in a way that they found favorable to those positions, with Maria saying that the media only covers what matters for them and going on to suspect that when the news reports that two people had died, 
they were probably 20 or 200 casualties. Anna seemed to agree with this sentiment, that mainstream media in particular was hiding or skewing information, while suggesting that social media was better at obtaining non-biased truth. Anna also cautioned, though, that she would not share news stories until she had read them thoroughly, as to not disseminate false information to those fighting in the conflict, while Grigori emphasized that it was every person's civic duty to help spread the truth. Although these beliefs may seem contradictory to us, both that disinformation is a good thing when it favors one side, and that it is every citizen's duty to spread the truth even if it's misinformation, that may be explained by the kind of media that these subjects consumed. As Pavlo and Maria both intimated that they refused to watch any stations that were sympathetic to Russian perspectives or were aired in the Russian language. Anatoly and Anna further went on suggesting that the Ukrainian state should continue its ban on Russian language channels, which began after the Euromaidan protests of 2014. Archem and Yuri even joked that anyone who watches Russian news is brainwashed or a Russian spy. Finally, those capitalist pigs will pay for their crimes, eh? Hey, comrades! Hey! Austin, we won. Oh, groovy, smashing, yay capitalism! Several interviews were also conducted with the idea of fog of war in mind, that conflict in Crimea and Donbass prevented real information from being disseminated, with these interviewees instead choosing to rely on the reports of personal friends or family over the news. When it comes to the Russia-Ukraine conflict then, even Ukrainians admit that they're untrusting of the coverage coming out of their own country, although particularly when it aired in the Russian language, understandably so, but also that they thought some disinformation may be helpful to their cause. And speaking of the fog of war, though, an often quickly changing media information associated with the war reporting influenced trust and perceptions of misinformation. When we discuss conflict between world powers, or even just national political parties, there will always be a kind of fog of war that obfuscates the truth. I can't see out of this thing often until long after the end of whatever that present conflict may be, be it an actual war or an electoral race. As we have seen thus far, as it refers to Western national politics, many people are distrustful of reporting, and seemingly recognize this fog of war effect on both sides of the left-right divide, seeing the other as the perpetrators of fake news. But how does that relate to war propaganda, often disseminated by governments involved in an actual war and not just a culture war? It was a propaganda bomb! And not just propaganda, but genuine, accidental or intentional misinformation. Given the novel scenario that began in Ukraine in early 2022, the data are still forthcoming. What we can do to better understand media information, misinformation and political polarization is look at other relatively recent global conflicts in comparison. Perhaps none has been more well-studied than the West's war on terror. Fog of war means inherent that news media will be riddled with retractions, corrections, and generally misinformation. Perhaps some of it intentional, but likely most of it unintentional. This reality of news coverage, however, may lead many people to have a false perception of a conflict, both during and after the events, as many may never be exposed to those corrections. And even if they are, the lasting nature of the psychological primacy effect that people will tend to believe whatever they hear first, may make information experienced first more salient than more recent and often more accurate data. This topic was covered in an analysis of American, German, and Australian subjects from Lewandowski et al. 2005 in relationship to the Iraq War, who completed a questionnaire about events that occurred between April and May of 2003. Participants were exposed to a series of topics that were either true, false, or originally reported on as true and then later retracted and were asked to recall any information that they remembered about that topic, as well as their perception of the truthfulness of the topic. Respondents were also asked if they believed weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs, were present in Iraq, suspicious of news regarding the coverage and their justifications for the invasion. Americans reported the destruction of WMDs was the most important reason to invade Iraq, followed by facilitating regime change, while the least important reason was finishing off the Gulf War. But as we all know, Americans never seem to want to finish what they've started. This shit I'm out. Mm -mm. This shit I'm out. No thanks. For Australians, regime change was the most important, followed by securing oil supplies for the West, while protection from Al-Qaeda was of lowest relevance. German subjects were the most concerned with securing oil, 
followed by regime change in Iraq and were least concerned with bringing democracy to the Middle East. Generally, respondents remembered the true events and did not recall the false news stories, as we might expect, because they were fake. However, only Americans and Australians recalled the retracted topics, while Germans, for the most part, expressed no memory that these stories had been retracted. Across all three groups, memory was better regarding the real events than the retracted news pieces. However, even though all groups had weaker memory of the retracted topics, only Germans and Australians rated those topics as less true, while Americans rated the retracted stories as equally true as the non-retracted ones. In other words, when Americans were told that a story was fake, this was basically their reaction. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Still don't care. I don't care. For those that did not trust the retracted messages, suspicion explained a lack of trust but only in Germans and Australians. Whereas for Americans, suspicion explained only 4% of variance in perceptions of the truth. Gee, I wonder why Germans and Australians might have a reason to distrust their governments. Americans also were far more likely to possess false memories than Germans or Aussies, with 34% of Americans in this sample remembering, incorrectly, that WMDs had in fact been found in Iraq, compared to 17% of Australians and 5% of Germans. These results are indicative that Americans tend to be relatively insensitive to corrections in the media and continue to believe media falsehoods even when they knew those stories had been updated. Of course, this was in context of a war that the US was more directly involved in than either Germany or Australia for the most part, which could explain some of these findings. However, I would be curious to see new polling regarding, say, the Hunter Biden laptop story to see what percentage of Americans still believe that story was fake, whether or not they've read the correction. Given that 2020 MRC polling illustrated that 45% of Americans polled were unaware of the Biden laptop story, and of those polled, 9.4% said they would not have voted for Biden had they been aware of it, I certainly think a replication covering that topic would be of interest, particularly considering that the same reporting indicated had people known about Biden scandals, Trump likely would have won several key states in 2020. But that's really neither here nor there. At least not anymore. What we can do to get an idea of how retractions regarding the Hunter Biden laptop scandal, for example, may have influenced opinions towards the conflict in Ukraine, however, is to look at how retractions influence people of different political opinions when that information is positive. And if you want positivity in America, you need only give Hunter a drug test of any kind. Or actually, a blood test of any kind. At this point, I'd be surprised if he does in fact not have feline HIV. Or negative towards their political in-group by looking to a study from Ecker, Zay, and Andorada, 2021, who exposed subjects with a variety of different versions of a news story, reporting on a study that claimed to find evidence that either Democrats or Republicans were three times as likely to be caught embezzling funds than candidates of the other major political party. Each story was comprised of 10 lines of text, the fourth of which was later retracted in the ninth line for some versions of the article, with the author of the study clarifying the results had been misinterpreted, and that either Democrats or Republicans, depending on the condition, were not found to be more likely to have embezzled funds. Some subjects read a version of the article with no such retraction. Respondents were asked about their personal political leanings and gave open-ended responses to the article. They were also asked to think about what would be a good headline for the article, as well as if they believed that Democrats or Republicans were more likely to embezzle after the fact. Recall of the information or misinformation later retracted in the article was dependent on whether or not that information was congruent with one's existing political worldview, and there was very little difference between recall for Democrats and Republicans. That is, when there was no retraction, people of both political alignments were more likely to recall that those of the other political ideology were more likely to have been guilty of embezzling than when that claim was retracted later in the report. When the report was such that participants read their own political group was more likely to embezzle, they were less likely to recall that information than when it applied to their political rivals, and the retraction was more potent in affecting recall when it referred to political opponents. In terms of sentiment expressed in open-ended responses, Republicans were more likely than Democrats to report sadness and shame after reading the worldview incongruent report about Republicans embezzling. Apparently, Democrats don't really feel that ashamed when their party leaders steal from the people. I'm not apologizing to that old bitch. Absolutely not. Similarly, Republicans used more angry words than did Democrats, particularly when they read the retractions or read the article that described Republicans as embezzlers. Interestingly, Republicans were just more negative in general, being more likely to utilize words like misuse and corruption, but tended to use the most negative words when describing the worldview congruent misinformation without retraction. That is, that Democrats were embezzling. And the retracted worldview incongruent article. That is, when the author had seemingly lied that Republicans were the real embezzlers. Don't you feel silly? Don't you feel stupid? No. As such, not only will people continue to believe false information after it has been retracted and corrected, 
how people will react to that retraction is influenced by political partisanship. Considering the results of this study, it's not surprising that Republicans were unhappy that they were lied to by the media concerning the Hunter Biden laptop story as being illegitimate, including its relationship to Ukraine. Not only because the narratives before the retraction also often described Republicans as crazy conspiracy theorists for even talking about it, but also because Republicans seem to get just a little bit angrier when the media is seen as lying about anything, even when it favors their side. And it's not difficult to see how that could apply to coverage of a conflict. In addition to irritating people, there's another problem with bad or biased narrative-focused reporting when it comes to the need for later retraction, whether it be about that pesky laptop or PPGate, and that's the potential for the backfire effect. Our cognitive heuristics often cause us to associate two concepts when we have been exposed to them in association many times or even a few times in the past, and often for good evolutionary reasons. After all, it's perhaps a wise thing to think that when there's smoke, there very well may be fire. A possible outcome of this propensity is that when an existing correlation is updated, it may be difficult for people to update their own cognitive mental schema, but also to perhaps see that update, even if it is designed to fix misinformation, as a lie or as manipulation. I'm doing important Why do you need to install updates? What updates? Some more spyware so the NSA can keep watching what I'm doing? Looking at my dick pics and watching me jack off? Spying on me? Obama? You I'm a racist! You made me a racist! which we can see in an analysis of the backfire effect from Swear Thompson et al. 2022 across two studies. Both studies in this set use the same procedure, exposing subjects to a series of 21 allegedly factual statements and 21 pieces of misinformation, and then three weeks later exposing the same subjects to the same initial statements, but this time either with a correction or an affirmation that the original statement was correct. Some of these were political, for example, initially stating that the gender wage gap was due to women being paid less for the same job, with the retraction adding that women earn less because they tend to select different jobs, work fewer hours, and for fewer years than men do. Wow, I'm actually kind of surprised that this study admitted that. While others were general factoids, for example, Marmite originally claimed to be a meat product, later corrected to describe it as being a yeast-based product. Upon the second exposure, participants indicated the extent to which they believed the item whether they had heard the statement before, whether it is important to the participants themselves, whether the information was true or false, and whether it was important to society, whether it was true or false. Across both studies, participants who read the corrected version tended to be more likely to update their belief on the veracity of these various subjects, more so than the control group who read nothing about the misinformation. Understandable. However, only two items produced evidence for a backfire effect that rivaled test-retest effects. That is, people may remember some piece of information more readily the more that they have seen that piece of information, the item about Marmite, and another that stated that testosterone repairs memory in older men. Although corrections did reduce belief persistence, much of it still remained in both experiments, and while belief in the repeated initial claim produced increased belief concerning that claim by, on average, about 25%, increased belief in the initial claim via a backfire effect hovered closer to an average of around 10%. Basically then, the more people hear a lie, the more likely they are to believe it. But some people will continue to believe a lie even after it has been corrected, as perhaps a form of psychological reactance. Perhaps most interestingly, the researchers found that people who were the most likely to experience the backfire effect were those who were unfamiliar with the subject matter before exposure to the experiments. That is, it seems that people who know the least in terms of background information and tend to have weaker pre-existing beliefs towards a topic also tend to be the most likely to increase in their beliefs in a corrected news story, rather than those who are more familiar with that topic. Just to reiterate then, the people who knew nothing about a topic beforehand tend to be the ones most likely to continue to believe lies about that topic even after information has been corrected. These people believe that failure is not their own and somehow inflicted upon them by the universe. You can't be bad at video games, as video games are merely a subject matter. No, that is a deficit in your cognitive ability, something that likely plagues you in every aspect of your life. Thorson, 2015, referred to these remnants of corrected misinformation as, quote, belief echoes, which she assessed across a series of experiments. In the first of these, subjects read a description of several politicians running for a local election. Then some were exposed to an article that claimed a convicted felon and murderer, Daniel Elzio, had been financially supporting one of the politicians, John McKenna, and had attended several fundraisers to support his candidacy. Finally, some subjects read a correction to this report that clarified the previous reporting had been incorrect, 
and that McKenna's supporter was actually a local car dealer named Daniel Elio. Afterwards, participants were asked if McKenna had received donations from a felon and gave their general impressions of the candidate. Those who read the correction continued to be more likely to believe that McKenna had accepted donations from a felon compared to the control group, who read no misinformation nor any correction. Although, to be fair, Elio was a car dealer and perhaps statistically more likely than average to be a felon. Similarly, evaluations of McKenna were still significantly lower after subjects read the correction. Interestingly, respondents reported that McKenna was actually slightly less electable when the misinformation about him had been corrected compared to when they had just read that he accepted money from a criminal, perhaps due to a perception of media manipulation and further corruption. The fairly obvious next issue that these results raise is the role that partisanship has to play in perceptions of the truth of a news story that has been corrected, which Thorson examined in his second experiment, this time describing McKenna as either a Democrat or a Republican. Curiously, while the same echo effect was present for politicians who represented the opposing political party, with some respondents continuing to state the retracted information was true compared to the control, when the politician was of the same political party as the subject, the false information was seen as less true than the control, meaning Republicans who had read that McKenna was also a Republican, who had been falsely accused of accepting donations from a felon, were less likely to think that McKenna had taken such donations from a felon than a Republican who had read no such description of him ever having taken such donations. Unsurprisingly, general evaluations of a candidate from the same political party as the subject were higher than evaluations of candidates from the opposing party. But for both, misinformation continued to serve as a dark shadow hanging over perceptions of a political candidate, remaining lower than the control group. As such, it doesn't matter if Trump didn't end up being removed from office over his conversation with Zelensky regarding Ukrainian prosecutor Viktor Shokin, or that he didn't really call extremists very fine people, or that he didn't pay hookers to pee pee on the Obama's bed, or that he didn't tell people to engage in an insurrection. By the time the information is corrected, the negative stigma such stories elicit can continue to negatively influence perceptions of a candidate, even from partisans of the same political party as that candidate. What the media ultimately chooses to focus on when it concerns international conflict, however, is not always so cut and dry. Obviously, with COOF regulations and restrictions waning, February of 2022 was a time period wherein the media was probably looking for a new crisis to fill the airwaves and fill their wallets. And Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a perfect topic to enthrall the masses. And I don't say that without reason, by the way. I say it because we can see, historically, how important Ukrainian news has been to foreigners. <laughs> Not just within the region, but globally, when it was perhaps less politically relevant worldwide, as seen in an analysis by Nigren et al. 2018 specifically regarding the 2014 Russian invasion of Crimea and revolt in the eastern Donbass region, following the overthrow of the previous Ukrainian government led by Viktor Yanukovych, being replaced by new president Petro Poroshenko and PM Arseniy Yatsenyuk. These scholars looked at the major themes being covered by news outlets from Russia, Ukraine, Sweden, and Poland in September of 2014. While Russia took over Crimea, following the region's own protests of the Ukrainian government, 30% of Sweden's total news coverage at the time was focused on the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, compared to 17% of Polish coverage and 13% of Russian coverage. In contrast, only 6% of Ukrainian coverage was focused on MH17, with far more coverage than other nations being devoted to the Ukrainian military and consequences for civilians in the region. However, despite the percentage of media attention given, the content of the media coverage also differed. In Ukraine, coverage, understandably, focused on the Russian enemy, with clear support for Ukrainian civilians, and not so much on the rebel organizations supportive of Russia operating in the Donbass. Russian coverage did focus somewhat on MH17, but was also concerned with support for the Russian government and protection of civilians in Donbass. In Poland, the threat of Russia dominated the news cycle, far outweighing concerns with Ukrainian civilians, and was typified by statements from Polish politicians on geopolitics rather than the humanitarian issues. Similar patterns to that of the Polish media were present in Sweden, in that Swedish coverage tended to focus on politics first, although the Swedish media tended to refer more commonly to the event as a conflict, while the Polish media referred to it more commonly as an invasion. There was clear bias in plenty of the language used across nations, as, for example, pretty much only the Russian media referred to protesters, rebels, well, whatever you want to call them, the people in Donbass that were overthrowing the extant Ukrainian government as the people's militia. 
Poland and Sweden preferred to use the term separatist, while Ukrainians preferred the term militants. Not only were different countries, even in the same region, covering the same event framed from quite different ways, but also nearby nations were seemingly, if not more, preoccupied with that Malaysian flight disappearing than a major area of Ukraine being seized by the Russian government because, for whatever reason, that just was a topic of less global concern in 2014 than it was in 2022. During a conflict, different people will inherently use media for different purposes. Obviously, those living in an area embroiled in war or fighting themselves have different information needs than people living on the other side of the planet, or maybe just the other side of a border, a subject that was examined by Melki and Cosman 2021 in the context of the Syrian war by conducting interviews with Syrians who were displaced or non-displaced, internally or externally within Syria or within refugee camps. Respondents were asked about their news media consumption and how interested they were in following the war. Unsurprisingly, 81.3% of all subjects said the topic was very important. Although, hang on, what's up with that 19% of Syrians who didn't think it was a big deal? I just want a grill for God's sake. More than half, 57.3% said that television news coverage was the most important way of keeping up with the news, followed by 34.8% who said talking to other people was very important. While the non-displaced were more likely to have access to a radio and to newspaper sources, all other groups assessed relied instead most heavily on television and internet via mobile phone. 48% of respondents said they spent one to two hours consuming television news media, while 44.5% said they spent between two and three hours talking to others about the conflict. Those who said the issue was more important, predictably, spent more time watching television and following the topic online. Although there were 49 different channels available for participants to choose from, only seven of them were chosen from more than 2% of the time as a primary news source, and those also tended to be rated as the most reliable and trustworthy sources. Trust in a news source explained 67% of variance in which outlets Syrians chose to access. Those who had been displaced and were living in refugee camps were most dependent on news, but those not displaced were also highly dependent on news as well. Again, these findings aren't exactly surprising, but they illustrate, first of all, that even people not necessarily in immediate danger tend to be highly interested in subjects that involve a conflict that they're involved in, but that other people in these situations tend to get their news information from sources that they already trust, rather than seeking out other, perhaps novel, sources. Similarly to the research of Melky and Cosman, Silverman, Kallenthaler, and Dagger 2021, and no, no, not that Silverman, there'll be no blackface here. No. We're interested in who tends to have more accurate information within a group of people who are being directly impacted by war by examining misinformation related to the conflict raging in areas of Iraq in 2016, some of which were under ISIL control at the time of data collection. Iraqi subjects were questioned to what degree they believed that missile strikes were coming from the US-led coalition force, mostly targeting the Iraq government's popular mobilization force, the PMF. The People's Front of Judea, splitters! We're the People's Front of Judea! Oh, I thought we were the Popular Front. People's Front! And that the missile strikes helped ISIL, both of which are false statements, as the coalition strikes mostly targeted ISIL and not the PMF, and the strikes had been damaging to ISIL instead as a group. Respondents were also asked if they lived in a region currently under ISIL control. Iraqis who had lived in areas actually targeted by the coalition airstrikes, so those under ISIL, were significantly less likely to believe disinformation that the US government was attacking their allies in the PMF or was assisting ISIL, understandably since they were living in the midst of it. However, news consumption also played a role in determining who was able to identify both questions as misinformation. Reliance on the generally pro-Shia al-Iraqiya TV predicted greater belief in the falsehood that the US coalition was targeting the PMF, which makes sense given the PMF's Shia appeal and Iranian backing. In contrast, reliance on the Sunni-friendly al sharqiya TV, and especially the Kurdish-oriented Ruda TV, predicted less belief in both misperceptions. As such, even people living in the middle of an active war zone can still be misled to hold incorrect views on that conflict due to some degree just media exposure. This tendency for people to continue to rely on certain sources even in times of insecurity and crisis in relationship to media distrust was studied by Schwarzenegger 2020. I was elected to lead, not to read. Using 49 interviews with German people of different age groups and media repertoires to understand who trusts the media and which media they trust. One would hope that older Germans are a bit more skeptical these days. 
Oh, you haven't been listening to Allied propaganda. Of course they're going to say we're the bad guys. But they didn't get to design our uniforms. <laughs> These interviews focused on the way people discuss media, attitudes towards journalism, as well as knowledge and opinions regarding misinformation. Participants distinguished different areas of interest in topics where they felt comfortable to judge the accuracy of that information from areas where they were not comfortable discerning accuracy, a concept that Schwarzenegger describes as selective criticality, and illustrated in the words of 45-year-old Marta, who expressed that she tries to avoid news biased in any political direction, saying, quote, I do not read the yellow press. I do read it at the doctor's, but I know it's rubbish. I do not waste my time with checking on something like that." Most interviewees believed the term fake news was itself politicized, but also tended to indicate that it referred mostly to legacy media outlets, with 51-year-old Jan stating that he prefers to use alternative sources such as Russia Today than international or national German sources. Although these interviewees expressed skepticism of much of the media, they also expressed a form of pragmatic trust in that it is simply impossible to be cynical of all media all the time, if for no reason than cognitive miserliness. Thus, respondents essentially chose which media outlets to trust, much as the interviewees in the Syrian sample. These German subjects had some outlets that they trusted a priori, and others that they were more willing to judge carefully. But many also intimated that they anticipated the news media to report truthfully about the facts, particularly as they concerned serious topics such as tragedies illustrating a naive pragmatic trust in the media apparatus, either for moral or practical reasons. As Anna explained, that news outlets would not report false information because, quote, they cannot afford it. If there were a scandal, it would be over for them. However, this seemed to apply to specific companies as being truthful while still understanding that others may be untrustworthy, a seeming paradox. History abhors a paradox. Further, subjects expressed a kind of confidence competence, believing that they would be able to easily identify fake news if they saw it, although as we've seen, that's rarely the case. Several respondents contrasted their own competence with a perceived lack of competence in others, seeing themselves as perhaps uniquely capable of discerning the truth. As Bernhard put it, mainstream or alternative, I question everything. I am always vigilant. However, of course, not all are like this. Others, like Gertrude, believed that they were likely incapable of knowing what the truth was by their own volition, and as such, had faith that the media would not lie to them, with some saying that they would ask friends or family to determine if an outlet was reliable. Some, like Desiree, looked for other clues as to the accuracy of news, believing a blog post about refugee violence purely because it was written by a local news source. Still others, like Ralph, unilaterally disbelieved all mainstream media, owning neither a television nor using newspapers, and mostly relying on YouTube and Facebook for news, often checking the comments just to see how wrong others were about any given topic. Such a brave stance you took, Aiden! Oh, you're so fucking brave! F*** you! What a brave stance you took! Give her a slap on the ass! As such, while there are many people who are critical of the media, even now, after so many instances of alleged fake news being found to be correct, and to the contrary, so much alleged real news being found to be inaccurate, there are still many people who trust journalists to do the work of research for them, placing the trust in the hands of the media to be honest, and that tends to apply mostly to specific trusted outlets, although which ones are deemed trustworthy vary by the individual, often believing local and politically aligned outlets rather implicitly. This is not new, however, of course, as trust in the media is how we got Mussolini. Not only does location and proximity to a conflict influence interpretations of media coverage of that conflict, political beliefs likely do as well. And when there is a fog of war, that means information often changes quickly and may be misreported on before later being corrected or updated. In the interim, people are often left with gaps in their understanding that may be filled with existing partisan beliefs to help fill in those gaps, and we can see how such a scenario, similar to that with the invasion of Ukraine, was understood by people in the West by looking to a study from Gaines et al. 2007 in relationship to information about the Iraq War. American participants were surveyed in a series of panel studies conducted between October of 2003 and December of 2005 regarding facts that they believed that they knew about the conflict to understand how perceptions may have changed across party lines. They found that all partisan groups, strong Republicans included, held reasonably accurate beliefs and seemed to have updated those beliefs as circumstances regarding the war casualties changed. Republicans, who at the time were the group more supportive of the war in Iraq, actually tended to have more accurate information regarding the number of casualties than were Democrats. Most subjects were aware that the U.S. had not found WMDs in Iraq, but Republicans were the least accurate on this point. 
in contrast to their accuracy concerning casualties, with a maximum of 17% reporting that WMDs had been found in August of 2004. However, by December, less than 10% of all political partisan groups held such a belief. Dude, these Iraqis love the fact that we are here. They love freedom and they thought that those fireballs last night were wicked, dude. You Americans have killed a lot of sand. The sand was very evil. Although Republicans were the most knowledgeable concerning casualties, and by the end of data collection were about as likely to believe misreports about WMDs as any other groups, support for the actions of George W. Bush changed little for strong Republicans who moved very slightly in their approval of the then-president during this time span. For all Democrats and Independents, there was a curvilinear pattern in disapproval of Bush, which began lower and then peaked around August of 2004 and began to decline again by December. A curvilinear relationship also existed for weak Republicans, but in the opposite valence, with disapproval being lowest during the same time period as when it was highest for Democrats and Independents. As previously intimated, strong Republicans never changed in their low levels of disapproval of his handling. Strong Democrats tended to see the casualties as very high around that same point in August of 2004, with this perception being lower beforehand and afterwards, and while this same trend was present in weak Democrats, the effect was less pronounced. Weak Republicans instead believed the casualties were very large only in late 2004 and into 2005, with few believing that the casualties were more than moderate. Strong Republicans only became more assured that the casualties were moderate as time went on. And again, remember, strong Republicans tended to be the most accurate regarding the actual numbers of casualties, regardless of their perception of the severity of the conflict. That is, even if all strong Republicans had believed that 1,500 troops had been killed and that number was completely accurate, nearly 90% of them would have still regarded that number as a moderate number, small or very small while more than three-quarters of strong Democrats would have described that same number as very large. These findings are not limited to Republicans, however, and seem to be more illustrative of broader political concerns and partisanship than support or disapproval of war in general, as data included here from a 1995 CBS New York Times poll regarding the Bosnian conflict of the time indicates. Democrats then expressed far more approval than Republicans for Clinton's handling of the situation expressed considerably more support than Republicans for the deployment of U.S. troops, and were far more likely to take the view that what happened in Bosnia was important to Americans. <laughs> Thus, while Republicans were more accurate in their knowledge of the situation in 2004 in Iraq, their political partisanship still influenced and colored their interpretation and feelings towards those facts as they concerned the handling of the conflict by a Republican president. Similarly, Democrats who were highly opposed to Bush's handling of the Iraq War were largely in support of Clinton engaging in similar actions a decade earlier in Bosnia. Thus, even if people have accurate information, their political beliefs and partisanship can still alter the way that we see that information. Although Democrats and Republicans' support for foreign conflict may be largely based on who the commander-in-chief is, as information is passed to the people from the president through the media, there are differences between the parties in who trusts those messages to be accurate. As illustrated, when Bush was in charge, Democrats tended to have an inaccurate perception of casualties in Iraq, while Republicans tended to have a perception closer to reality. But they didn't have such concerns when Clinton was in office regarding Bosnia. Democrats, that is. Is it the case, then, that one side of the aisle just always distrusts the media more? Or is it always dependent on other factors, like one's trust in government or who is in charge of that government? That question was assessed by Lee, 2010, who examined political partisanship, cynicism, interest, efficacy, that is the belief that one can influence politics, perceptions of the economy, general trust, and media trust in the years of 96, 98, 2000, and 2004. He found that political partisanship and conservative ideology had no real effect on trust in the government. However, other factors were significant, namely evaluations of the economy and personal trust in other citizens were both related to political trust, which in turn was related to media trust. Conservatism and identification with the Republican Party were, however, directly negatively related to media trust as well. That is, while right-leaning people may always generally tend to be less trustful of the media, their political ideology itself is unrelated to trust in the government, and instead it is economic concerns and personal trust in society outside of partisanship that influenced trust in the government, and through that, trust in media. Additionally, while Democrats and moderates were always more trustful of the media, there were fluctuations of that trust that tended to peak and sink at about the same times as Republican trust in the media similarly rose and fell. 
Thus, even though Democrats tend to be more trustful of media than Republicans, this difference appears to be reliant on the economy and civic trust more than partisanship. As such, when the economy is failing and there is a high level of distrust between the citizenry, likely no one's going to trust the government, and when no one trusts the government, nor do they trust the media that covers it. Well, that all is starting to sound a little bit familiar now, isn't it? The dangerous, you know, edges here are that he's trying to undermine the media, trying to make up his own facts. And it could be that while unemployment and uh, the, the economy worsens, he could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control right. uh, exactly what people think. And that yeah. is the that is if our you... job. The curvilinear relationships identified by Gaines et al and the mediated role that trust in the government plays in trust in the media, seen in Lee's data, seem to be indicative that people end up forming quite polarized opinions during the height of a conflict and then snap back to a normative state. We're snapping back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. Mom's spaghetti. Similar to opinion levels expressed at the beginning, a tendency Baum and Growling 2010 described as the elasticity of reality. Their model proposes that when a news story regarding an international conflict is new, information is disseminated by the elites, be they politicians or diplomats or military leaders, the reality of which is more or less up in the air, as the media will not have immediate access or ability to fact-check many of these statements or claims or do on-the-ground reporting. Over time, as more information comes in, the reality will start to converge both with media reporting and the framing disseminated by elites. At this point, people most likely will have already formed opinions and gleaned what they want to know about the topic and may cease to pay as much attention to the news, hence why there are these lasting effects of misinformation, even in the face of direct retraction. People already feel like they know everything they need to know, with the only people mostly remaining uninfluenced by new information being nonpartisans who haven't already made up their minds. In their analysis, respondents were queried about the trending casualties and the prospects for a US victory in Iraq as well as the ability of the Bush administration to influence public opinion on Iraq following the troop surge of 2007. They found that Democrats and independents believed incorrectly that casualty rates had remained roughly constant between March and December of 2007, while Republicans believed correctly that the average monthly casualty rate had receded over the same time period. Democrats, again, had already made up their minds on the situation and thus ended up being less accurate and less informed due to a slowdown of new information consumption. It was not until September that Democrats and independents joined the Republicans in the belief that the Bush administration was making some sort of progress in Iraq. This shift was reflected in the New York Times, which went from publishing no positive information about decreasing casualties to covering the subject, leading to a 4% general increase in support for the war. Although the initial increases in positive coverage caused minor, non-significant decreases in war support initially, perhaps indicative of a kind of belief echo. Despite this, news coverage remained largely negative, comprising 68% of reporting. But these scholars found that positive coverage from the New York Times, when the narrative began to shift, was more influential on opinions than any negative coverage. Any statement from Bush regarding the war increased public support. However, given the Democrats started out at such a low level of support, this increase was more moving towards a level more closely aligned to that of independents and Republicans rather than indicating a large swell of support for the W in general. Over time, however, the impact of presidential statements became minimal, but this may have been influenced by the major mistakes made by the Bush administration, to put it mildly, including claiming a preemptive victory when US military involvement, as we now know in hindsight, would not really end anytime soon. These data then are illustrative that when reality does not align with the political beliefs of news outlets, those outlets will tend to only very slowly update their coverage to reflect reality, and in turn, there is a staggered effect of accurate information getting to partisans who read partisan news and are not inclined to believe coverage that does not align with their worldview because it is psychologically painful to do so. As such, while eventually news coverage may start to reflect reality, such as the case with the Hunter Biden laptop story so many years after it broke, or the months it took for the New York Times to start reporting accurately on casualties in Iraq, it takes time for reality to sync up with partisan coverage and partisan beliefs. However, the positive takeaway from this study is that eventually, reality does catch up with narratives, but this can take months, if not years, if not decades. And so it likely won't be for a long time, if ever, that we can really know the truth behind the fog of war. But for now, all we can try to do is analyze the media critically in an attempt to cut through that fog as futile as it ultimately may be. And with that in mind, let's come to a few conclusions.
Today, we looked at how media misinformation and corrections tend to result in decreased perceptions of the trustworthiness of news media, but also how those corrections tend to create belief echoes that persist even after the information, having been found to be false, has been updated. This is not always a nefarious practice on the part of news organizations or governments, as available data often changes, and even a journalist with the best of intentions can often get a story wrong. However, that lasting effect persists, regardless of intent. Further, we are sometimes consciously or subconsciously motivated to change our minds or continue to believe a retracted story so long as it aligns with our political beliefs and ideology. Specifically, in the latter case, changing an opinion we have championed can cause psychological discomfort in the form of cognitive dissonance. When we're involved in an active conflict, of course that tendency is only exacerbated because obviously we will want to believe that our side are the good guys. The effects of partisanship and locale when combined with the fog of war then often lead to temporarily inaccurate reporting. However, that's only exacerbated by the persistence of belief echoes and misinformation. As such, it's important to temper our reactions to news stories with a healthy dose of skepticism, and sometimes wait for a little bit more information before basing major decisions on a news headline. But hey, what do you guys think? Do you trust the media? Only certain outlets? Or do you generally distrust all outlets across the board? Have you ever encountered someone who continued to believe a false news story long after it was corrected? Have you ever fallen for fake news? I mean, I know I have. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below to feed that algorithm. And while you're down there, if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Also, check out my sponsor, Magic Spoon, linked in the description and the pinned comment to get $5 off your order of a delicious and healthy cereal by using code AIDEN, that's A-Y-D-I-N. As always, I want to give an enormous thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are amazing and you allow me to make long, unnecessarily detailed videos like this one. If you want to join these fine folks on the screen, links to support are also down below, as well as a link to my merch store. Finally, you'll also find a link to my podcast, Broken Crown, which I do with my co-host Spoon every Wednesday at about 8.30 GMT, 3.30 Eastern Time, as well as all of the citations in this video as usual. Thank you all so much for sticking around through the end, and as always, dear friends, all town of volts. Irresible.